Hey everybody, welcome to season four, episode 23 of the Hard Truth Inside the Football Industry podcast with me, Philip Eidson, and Darren McAnthony, the chairman and owner of Peterborough United. And we're recording this. We thought we'd squeeze one in on Friday morning, uh, our time here in the US. So hopefully we'll be able to get this out there before the games uh, this weekend. But uh, it's been a pretty crazy week, I think, for both of us. But we're both now in one piece, both at home. So how are you doing, Dara? Yeah, good. Yeah, a lot of travel, obviously, in our life. It's always this time of the year, isn't it? So I obviously did Dubai and, uh, yeah, uh, obviously happy to be home. But from here on in until the end of May is fucking madness for me. I got, like, a kid graduated from high school. So Mm -hmm. I don't know if people know in America the amount of things that go on events-wise all the way up until May graduation. Then I've obviously got him going to college. So we're down to the final three choices. So we've got to go visit those three colleges the next four weeks before he decides by May the 1st. I got to get to England. Got a Wembley final. Obviously, promotion run in. It's it's like yeah, I'm going to be. I've spent a lot of money on flights this fucking last kind of few weeks, you know. So yeah, but no one's complaining. This is life. This is part mm-hmm. of it all. So it's all good. But yeah, it's been. Um, yeah, when did we last speak? I think after the the, the was it the when did we speak? So you had uh, since we last spoke, uh, you beat Burton three one, and then you had the Stevenage three one. Right, yeah, Burton. So glad not to have to play on that pitch. Uh, it's probably worse than Bradford's and ours. I'm not sure um, about that. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's a whole like left side of it that was like I've never seen anything like it. It was mm. just mud. And um, fair play to Burton. They they tried to stifle us. And what was great about that is that you know we dominated the game, scored in the second half. Then they scored from a fucking long throw in. Um, which is fucking. I just hate watching these things. Like mm. you know. And they're fighting for their lives. And then, to be fair, the manager went plan B. We brought Jono on. It was that kind of pitch. Him and Malik won us the game. And and you get out of there and you're like, fuck it. When Burton are playing that well and, and it's tough at their play, it's not a place you want to go to in the final 10 games of the season. So to get out with a win was great. Stevenage, then it's a bit like Burton. You know what to expect. Physical. And I'm watching the first 20 minutes of the Stevenage game. And I'm like puzzled. I'm like, I, I can't believe what I'm watching. And I'm not going to be critical of my players because, you know, they can't be brilliant for 90 minutes every game. But they, it's safe to say they were a little bit <coughs> they were a little bit off. They were a little bit not at their not at their best typical standards. And, um, you know, you watch the game on TV. It was one of them games where I felt they couldn't keep their press up for 90-odd minutes. Mm-hmm. They couldn't do what they were doing. What they're very good at is turning the ball over. They're very good at getting at you. They're very good at winning free kicks in and around your box. They're very good at being physical. You know, you saw that on the TV, but I always knew, and I guess it's safe to say, playing at six out of ten, we still had a chance to 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 win the game, and we did, and we were ruthless and clinical, and and that's all that fucking mattered. But you know, Stephen, it's fair play to them. They're they're a side that nobody would fancy to be up there. Nobody yeah. in the nobody in League One. I don't care if you're Derby, Portsmouth, Bolton, the big clubs want to play Stevenage. Nobody, and that's that's a credit to Steve Evans and his players. And we've come a long way where we'd be one of those nobodies, but I, I don't feel like that about anybody in League One. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you're if you're if you're physical, I don't care if you're direct, I don't care if you play Brazilian style football. I always feel like I would back our players most of the time to win a lot of games of football. Yep. And I think our patience shown true. I think our goalie and our back two, the centre backs were very good. Everyone else was probably like Mm-mm, for the night. Uh, and obviously the talking points everyone's gonna get to. Stevie was having an aneurysm after the game about the the penalty, and it was a penalty. They should have had a penalty. But I actually feel it was probably a good thing for them they didn't get the penalty Mm -hmm. because we're a little bit different this season, as Northampton found out. You score early against us, you wake us up. Yeah. And if if we'd fully woken up, I think, you know, them going one up might have – we would have gone the other way and just scored quite a few goals. So well, I think yeah. it's I think it's fair to say that they could have been uh, in other circumstances down to ten men as well. Right. So so the, where Stevie's Stevie's right about that, and I wish Sky had asked him that night. Mm-hmm. That you know, fifteen minutes before their penalty, uh, their player basically committed GBH on Ricky yeah. Jay Jones, who's actually an ex academy player of ours. And he, I saw it, I, I, the replay and everything else. I mean, what he did was out of order. I mean, he bang out of fucking order. Um, so I don't know what Pidge was doing. But it wasn't an accident. No, he and, looked at him. Yeah. You could see on. You could see him look. He, he cracked him, he knew. and then he, he knew. Did he, he, knew. Him. he knew. Listen, Ricky's a threat to every back four. Ask Northampton. He retired four of their players. You know, I think all back all their back four were substituted mm-hmm. in that game. Yeah, and I think Pitch thinking me clever. I'm going to be physical against this guy. I'm going to fucking make sure he doesn't want to yeah. close me down. Yeah. I'm going to make sure he doesn't want to press. So he basically assaulted a 21 year old lad, and and thought that was acceptable. So. 
Um, yeah, I mean, he's lucky I wasn't there. I probably would have, the first time in my life, I would have pulled a Mariakis from Forest and been on the pitch. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And like, you know, so that was out of order, but it is what it is. If, if that's what you want to do, you do what you... The great thing about us now is, is that things like that, not so long ago, would have affected us. Yeah. But I think you do that to us now. And I think you're in danger of winding my players up. And if you wind my players up, I think they have the capacity to fucking smash the life out of you. Mm -hmm. So I, I would tread very carefully if you're a physical team thinking that you can come and bully, can bully my, right. my young players yeah. because they're, they're not to be bullied in that way. So um, anyway, it is what it is. We won the game. Steven and you're going to be up there. Uh, you, have a, you know, a lot of respect for what they've done. Everyone always talks about their low budget, including Steve. I always like to say to Steve, you're full of shit because I know mm -hmm. what he paid our players when he signed them in the mm -hmm. summer. But you can't take away from the fact that him and Reigns are doing a fantastic job. And I still fancy them to be top six. So, you, you know, they keep clean sheets. They're tough to break down. They can score goals. Yes, they're having a bit of trouble with that at the moment, but that, you know, that'll come good. They're not the team you want to play in the running. So, you know, getting that one, getting Burton out of the way, great. You know, then it leads up to the big game tomorrow. Um, and that game takes care of itself because of the crowd, the, the, the you know, the expectations. And that's Portsmouth. Mm. Um, for any neutrals that, out there. <laughs> that, that is the best team in League One. Yeah. And the reason you can call them the best team in League One is because they've been top of the league all season. Mm -hmm. And any team after 36 games is top of League One and been there the whole time are the best team in League One. Yeah. You know, Derby fans will cry they are. Bolton fans will say they are. A few posh fans will say they are. Barnsley will say they are. Portsmouth are the best team in League One. And to be the best, you've got to beat the best. So it's another unique challenge for our young groups. Young, you know, I was looking at the Sky graphic about the youngest team in League One that came up and we're still the youngest by a few months and take our goalie out of it and we'd be even further, mm -hmm. you know, miles younger. But um, it's another challenge for our young guns. Um, it's going to be a great game. I, you know, at the end of the day, people are like, what's the expect? You know, we expect to win all the time, but you're playing the best and you're going to have to be at your best to beat the best. Yeah. And I don't think we'll have a Stevenage. I don't think we get away with beating Portsmouth with a Stevenage-like performance. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, at this time of the season, you don't really care about your performance. You care about the result. So... I'm not sure about tomorrow as regards to are we going to play really well and win? Are we going to play okay and win? Yeah. Are Portsmouth going to play you know, to their best ability? It's going to be a good game of football. So I'm looking forward to it. These are the games you sign up for. These are the games you want. I guess if somebody had said to our fans in the summer, nine, ten games to go, you know, you, you, you're basically playing top yeah. of the table with a yeah. game in hand and you could have a chance in a few weeks to be three points off top. I guess our fans would have been like, are you fucking crazy? You know, and, and you know, well, it was all doom and gloom at the start of the season, wasn't it? Oh, we've well, got all these young uh, kids, and you yeah, know, this year we're yeah. not going to go for the playoffs or compete. Um, yeah. so and that yeah. keeps getting thrown at me all the time. I've seen a fan the other day, one of our fans saying it to another fan, there was no expectation. Even the chairman said mid table, uh, you've never heard those words come out of my mouth. Mm. So, look, it's enjoyable, it's great, but you know, we've got now the, the business end of the season, you've got two months left or six, seven weeks left. You've got is it nine league games and one cup final. So, yeah, it, it is what it is. This is what you work all summer for. This is what you recruit for. You know, let's get at it. We lost Hector. That'll be a big loss, but I've got a lot of confidence. If Ryan comes in, I've got a lot of confidence. That's why we recruited him. Yeah. People talk about, I keep seeing things the other day about our lack of squad strength, but at the same time, I'm watching John and Malik come on and win against Burton. I'm watching Malik and David Adjiboy come on the other day and win the game against Stevenage. I'm watching players slot in. I'm watching Jadel move into right back when we lose our captain and right back, uh, Kyoso. Mm -hmm. You know, for apparently a team that doesn't have a lot of squad strength, we, we seem to do okay with what's in our squad. And you've had a relatively settled squad through the season, so those players haven't had the chance to show what they can do because Correct. they haven't had the opportunities to come Correct. into the team. But if they keep coming off the bench and winning us yeah. games, and we always talked about tired legs late in the season, and we've got a lot of pace, and we've got a lot of pace on our bench. If they keep coming on and doing it, that's what a squad's for. And, you, you know, behind that, we have other players. So, you know, everyone goes on about strong squads and strong teams. I've always said our squad's a good squad. You know, it's a young squad. It's a good squad. Can you call a phenomenal top squad? We'll find out after 46 mm -hmm. games because that's when you look back and go, oh, that was a really good squad. <laughs> well, I do want to just give a shout out outside of the game tomorrow to Portsmouth and Portsmouth fans because they've been through a lot. You know the last oh, absolutely. few years. Abs so absolutely, as absolutely. a neutral, um, you know they're one of the teams that you're happy are doing well and and you know kind of getting things back on track again after look some tough yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, you know, I know the Eisners get a lot of stick, but you know they they 
they made Portsmouth a very, very well-run football club. They've done a lot of good things, a lot of good people behind the scenes. I think they've got a good young manager who stepped up impeccably. Started last season when he came in midway yeah. through. They're a long unbeaten run. They have an identity. Like I said to you, anyone who's top of the table after this long and, and been up there, not just come from nowhere, have been there since the start. There are no mugs. They've got a fan base that's basically a Premier League fan base. You know, I know they can't sell. I think it's 20,000 is their capacity. They probably have 30,000 like a Derby. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? If they're in the Premier League. So you've got to give kudos to them. Um, they're expected now to, their fans are expecting them now to finally go that one step further. Yeah. You know, and, and behind that, you've got some magnificent teams. You've got Derby, you've got Bolton, mm-hmm. you've got Barnsley. I mean, Jesus, League One, it really is. A, it, 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 it's a fascinating league. But special special shout out to Lincoln. Lincoln are like a train on fire. Special shout out to another one of my little uh, um, punts that I spent five grand on acquiring a couple of years ago. And, you know, everyone at Peterborough was like, mm, you know, about this kid. Mm-hmm. And uh, Joe Taylor, I think he's yeah. got 18 league goals. He's, he's flying for Lincoln. I didn't want to sell him last year, but I knew my managers weren't really going to play him, didn't fancy him, but I always knew there was a player in there. Yeah. Um, and, and Luton are going to get the benefit, and we'll probably get a bigger benefit in the sell-on. But credit to Lincoln, their management, their owners, what they've done. You know, they're that team that's doing well late. You know, late and oriented before then we're doing that. You know, so it, it, it's fascinating in there. There's a batch of clubs now. Your late and orients, your, your Blackpools, your mm-hmm. Lincolns. You know, they're like fighting in Stevenage and Oxford are kind of like, oh, leave us the fuck alone, you know, kind of thing. So, so you know, it's going to be a really, really fascinating end to the season. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Yeah, it's pretty close for that sixth spot at the moment, just looking at the table. Um, sure. You know, two points, three points in it. Uh, those clubs in Blackpool, Oxford, Lincoln, Leighton Orient just a little bit behind, but that can all change in a week. Yeah, all um, good clubs, um, you know, and, and, and not mugs. And, and and tough, you know, and obviously we've, you know, we've played a lot of them recently. And again, like the other night playing sixth in the table. And, you know, again, like I said to you, Stephen and Janelle Muggs, and, and that was another good win. So, you know, nine games to go, you know, potentially a few more of the nine go to plan, not so much. So, you know, that's all you can ask for at this stage of the season, right? Yeah. And then you got Carlisle at home. And um, yeah. as yeah. I know more than anybody after the last week, you can never underestimate anybody. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not interested in what comes after Portsmouth. I'll, I'll worry about that after Portsmouth. And one of my gem scouts sent me a whole fixture thing about the top of League One, who they're playing. And I'm like, I, I don't care about the fixtures. Yeah. I don't care who's playing who. I don't care about – I only care about our next game. Like, everyone was losing their shit the other night because everyone won on Tuesday and we were playing on Wednesday. And I'm more like, yeah. Jesus Christ, what, is, is it the final weekend or something? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, it's irrelevant. Yeah. People are going to beat each other at this yeah. stage of the season. If we do our thing, we'll end up doing really well. You know, if we don't, we don't, you know, but, you, you know, I, I, I always fancy us. I always fancy us to go on a run. We're on a run. We need to extend the run for as long as we can. And we have aspirations to get promoted. You know, tomorrow are the games you've got to win. Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, and yes, you're right. Carlisle, Portfell, you're playing teams who are fighting for their fucking lives. So I think Carlisle gave Barnsley a scare the other night. You can't, you can't look at any game and go, that's a banker. You know, people yeah. would have said us, us going to Burton was a banker. Yeah. With six minutes to fucking go, we're looking at going, fuck. We're looking not to lose this. Mm-hmm. So so nothing in this league is a banker. So you, you're going to see results. Like you just said about Bradford, you lost the fucking, the, the veggie burger fellas club, didn't you, on, on whatever during yeah. the week. And, and you, you know, that's football. You would have expected. That was at your place, right? Yeah. So, and I, ex- <laughs> I, I went into that expecting to lose anyway, because that's just... That's no, just no. typical. The, I know. It's the wrong mindset. I know. Uh, it's a, You know what? When you've had the crap that we've had for the last few years it's hard mm. to be positive so okay so forget posh forget yes. all that for a moment and just a quick shout out to our fans they're selling shitloads of tickets for the cup final mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're filling up our away travel they're coming to our home games they have been in my 18 years this is the best it's been posh fans wise support wise throughout christmas i've seen it they've bought into everything and i I don't even need to ask them to support us over the last eight, nine games because I know they're going to be there. So I'm just, I'm very thankful for that. Season tickets are on sale. They're doing the same. And it's just, you know, I I, I couldn't express more gratitude to the fan base for just staying with us no matter what. Even when we were losing games, they were staying with us, Barty, all few fucking D-Mac outers. I mean, they were like, they were with us. And, uh, you know, it's um, it's been one of my favorite things this season, that closeness coming back with the fan base. And yeah. You know, and, and, and making that happen and learning from mistakes. And whilst we don't always get it right, we try and get most of it right. So, yeah, massive credit to them. Let's move on to Bradford. Mm-hmm. Tell me what went wrong on Tuesday. 
Yeah, you know, so you're back to you know a week ago you were thinking playoff run here yeah, we go. We had the best run like, in the league, <laughs> and then we beat yeah. we beat Accrington three 0 at her, uh, three 0 away. Yeah. Sorry on Saturday, and yeah. that was um, it. Probably pa- I don't know if it papered over cracks, but it was Accrington. You know, you, we talked about you playing kids, having a young team. You've got a young team who because they deserve to be in that team. Accrington had a very young team, and you could just tell from the off that it was you know kids who should still be in the academy. That were kind of right. drafted in, and so right. it was men against boys, and it was right. three three nil pretty early on, and right. um, it's it felt like we took the, the the foot off the pedal when it got to three nil. Um, probably could have been a lot more, and so you go right. you go away from that being very enthusiastic, but it also oh, yeah. probably was, like I say, a little bit unfair of a matchup. Um, but you go into Forest Green and. Um, to be honest, I, with the event that I was at this week, I only got to see 15 minutes of the game. But, you know, I've read plenty about it since. It sounded like another one of those that we didn't show up. They got a goal in the first minute. Right. The, the, the amount of times that teams get a, a very early goal and then just shut up shop at Valley Parade and we've got no way of getting through them. Um, right. And I think that's basically what happened. We Poor performance. And then they got a penalty in like the 95th minute. Um, right, but they got the goal. Shop, shop. We had no answer, um, and so pretty frustrating. But you know, the, the the fan base goes from playoffs are only a few points away to season's done. You know, with one result, and as we have learned, season's not done until it's done. And so let me we- ask you. Let me let me ask you a question. Yeah. Um, if you finish twelfth this season, yeah. Let's say you finish. I don't know, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, whatever yeah. else. What do you want to do in the summer? Are you keeping the manager? Yes. Oh, okay. I think um, I think we've seen enough to suggest that um, with more time and maybe some of his own players. Okay. That, um, Who's recruiting the players now, by the way? Because you used to have Mark Hughes' guy. Um, well, who, who, it was who's never, doing it now? So Mark Hughes never really had a guy, but we brought in uh, somebody who Ex-Middlesbrough was, guy. Yeah, so he was brought in okay. just before Mark Hughes. So right. he's still head of recruitment. Okay, okay, okay. So you trust in him to rebuild in the summer? Um, I may plead the fifth on that one. Uh, you've, got quite, sure. you've got quite an old midfield and an old attack. Uh, this is what, uh, you know, this is part, what is going to be really interesting in the summer is season ticket sales are going to be down. You know, yeah, I don't think that that's in question. They've actually put them up to something like 250 quid. So there's okay. a little bit of a bump in season ticket prices. There's, um, you know, a lot of unhappiness right now, and it's it's hard to sell the hope. You okay. know, usually you go into this stage of the season, you're starting to tr- sell some hope and get everyone excited yeah. to buy their season tickets, and that doesn't really exist. You know, you've got long, long time season ticket holders, you know, 30, 40, 50 year season ticket holders who just kind of had enough at the moment. And, um, you know, I know a lot of folks who, because of iFollow and the games being on iFollow in midweeks, are not even going in midweek. They're just going and watch, which is good for the club this year because they get paid twice, right? (laughs) Because they get the iFollow money, but that's not necessarily encouraging for next year. With it being a self-sustained model, you just wonder what impact that's going to have on the ability of wages. And so... But but, but you need a rebuild, right, in the summer? We probably... um, you got like what? What your your midfield yeah. has got? What three thirty plus year olds yeah. in there? We Probably need some on youth. good wages. And You've got a- Andy Cook is what thirty two. Yeah, you know when when you you start adding up the wages for Cook and yeah. the two midfielders and whatever yeah. else, yeah. you could probably get six players for their wages who are under twenty four. Yeah, so that's that's where you look at a rebuild. Or, I mean, or am I being too like vicious with those players? No, um, I mean Andy Cook's going to be sticking around for another two years because we gave him a three year contract last summer. Oh, right, but to okay. be fair to him, you know, he's still scoring the goals. But there's a little bit of question what, you know, you've done with uh, with Johnson. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, is the style of play being dictated to by the goal scorer? Well, of um, course. I mean, um, we're now, I think we have 102, 103 goals for the season. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's 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 moving a double golden boot when we're out of our yeah. 11. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, like, yeah. I mean, my view generally is that we have to rebuild about around youth. Um, and what... We typically have been doing, and this is what really frustrates me, and there's kind of a difference between – so something you always do and you're always looking at is the health record, like the injury Correct. record. And so what I feel like we do is either we look at that and hope that, well, they're not going to get injured when they play for us, or we don't really look at that. So we, we, we're in the kind of market for those who are 
cut price, you know, have experience, you know, you look and say, who has the ability to play at Valley Parade? And who has the ability to play in that kind of tension and those kind of crowds? And so you get these older, more experienced players, but you can't necessarily afford the wages. So you're picking the ones that have been injured, hoping that they're not going to be injured for you. And what you end up with is these older players who are still getting well paid, who are still injured a lot of the time. And that's been one of the difficulties of the last couple of years. So, so, so I, I've wrestled with this, and the, the, the decision we went down with was we've invested a bit more on our staff mm -hmm. and we've had less squad players. So we make the decision, do you want a 24-man squad and okay staff? Yeah. Or do you want a 22-man squad and yeah. use the, the, the saved wages in those two players you could have signed and spread it across a better physio, better sports science, mm -hmm. some help, some more stuff? Because the idea being is if, if your staff can keep 22 players fit and the spine of your team fit, you don't need 24 players. Right. So they're those decisions you wrestle with. And I might go one step further in the summer. So you want a, a, a smaller squad, better staff, better coaching, better help for the management team if you believe in them, which I do in mine. Yeah. You want, you want to keep them. Uh, 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 and you go, okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to take 70 grand out of, or 80 grand out of signing that extra player for the squad. And I'm going to, you know, throw that across two or three employees, give them bumps, do whatever yeah. else and keep them and get them a bit of help. So they're all those kind of, you, you, you make a decision and you have to stick with that decision and, and whatever. And we kind of did that this season, you know what I mean? And thankfully it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's been good. So no, I get what you need to do. I mean, I just, you know, did the Valley pray faithful, you know, as good as Andy Cook is, do you go, well, Jake Young's your striker, right? So, yeah. So do you, do you take him out of the team and play Jake Young every week mm -hmm. for the rest of the season? If you're not going anywhere. Well, he's plan. injured for the rest of the season, oh, but you, know, you could build around him for next season. Right. Do you, do, you, do you say, well, you know what, as good as the two midfielders are on their day, again, you know, do we look at that and go, you know, this is late in the season now. This is where you worry about tired legs. This is where you worry about players north of 30. The last eight, nine games, if you're in the run-in, do they have the legs to play three mm -hmm. times a week? Do they have the energy, the levels? And, you know, I guess we'll find out with Bradford. Look, for all we both yeah. know, we could win seven in a row. And, we don't and, know. And the manager question is very situational to me. Like, I think in the situation where you're not going to have the highest wages mm -hmm. and somebody who could probably mold together the best of what we can get into something that's competitive, I think he can do that. You know, if, if someone was going to throw me a bunch of money and say, okay, you're kind of starting from scratch, I wouldn't have him as my manager. I'd be looking for a younger manager who can bring together a younger squad with a different philosophy and start building from the youth, you know, all the way through. Um, but you'd that's go, you, 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 you'd go and get the Barrow manager. Right. Uh, which, wild, right? which we could have done, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, but then he was less proven. And so but you look at MK Dons went and got the Gateshead manager. Yeah, exactly. That kind of, you, you, you know, you know, the reason why, you know, the, the, the reason given for not going for him at the time was we don't have a squad to support it. But if you actually right. take a step back and say, let's give him two years and realize that he might not have the squad today, but it's all about building the squad for him tomorrow, that would have arguably been a more effective long-term strategy. But yeah. we're in this still short-term one-year cycles. And so those one-year yeah. cycles are just all about what's the best chance of getting promoted next year and hoping that one year it comes off. Or, or you finally go and get Steve Evans and then lift off. Yeah. Yeah. Not sure about Paul Rayner, though. They come as a package. <laughs> I know they do, don't they? <laughs> you, you know, what have I said? What would Steve Evans do with Bradford? I know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like, there's, a, there's a lot of people jealous of Stevenage right now. It's funny. We, talk about them. we talked about them last week. And not to be condescending about, oh, little Stevenage, look how well they're doing. Sure. They've, sure. they've done a great job. Oh, fucking unbelievable job yeah. unbelievable job listen i mean my manager does what i think he can do he gets manager of the year for doing it after the sheffield wednesday stuff and having the youngest team in the league but if it's not him you'd say steve yeah. evans manager of the year so yeah. um absolutely so if i were bradford i'd be like but I, I don't think the owner has the appetite to to do that and sign 20 odd players and give yep. steve that power to shape the squad but the one thing you would shape it is bradford would win back-to-back -back promotions mm -hmm. If you're yeah. an owner and you go, I need to sell Bradford, do I sell them in League Two or do I sell them in the champ? Well, actually, it's worth a fortune in the champ. I'm going to take this guy for two years, get mm -hmm. us to the champ, and then I'm selling the club for fucking, you know. Anyway, enough about that because the Bradford yeah. fans get upset with me whenever I say it. So, you know, that that would be, yeah, you know, simple as. And so we've got Mansfield at home tomorrow. Then we've got Notts County at home. 
and okay. then Harrogate away. I don't know what has happened to Notts County, except for, of course, the manager leaving. Um, but we'll see. It's, it, that may be a different Notts County than we got tanked by. It, it, it's a completely, it's a good, completely different Notts County, I think. I think they've really struggled since, obviously, the manager left. Yeah. And that was always going to be the case. I don't know if the new manager is, the, is in the same style vain or if they've changed i haven't seen them it'd be interesting here for notts county fan has it been too much too soon trying to mm-hmm. change the style or if they tried to continue what they were doing because all i would have done if you come in as the manager go, don't change anything yep just just let them play who the is way the carbon copy of who as much as we yeah. can get for the old guy yeah yeah so anyway enough about brad from posh let's talk premier league what else so, we talk well about? when we talk premier league let's talk about premier league and the deal for efl funding so what was it? Ten clubs, eleven clubs. Oh, it was. It was just reading about Bournemouth, mm-hmm, Nottingham Forest. You know, clubs who you're thinking. I mean, Bournemouth I get the Bournemouth. I, I mean, they're owned by an American. I get it. He's a billionaire. You know, but like, do me a favour. I mean, come on. And I'm hoping Bournemouth fans. fans I, I hope their fans, fans agree with me. Yeah, I do. hope their fans agree with me. I yeah. hope they do, because Bournemouth are like more made in the EFL. You know, right. Bournemouth. You know, uh, ten years ago all through my ownership were, you know, in trouble at the bottom of League Two. Yeah, we had people... battles with them in League One. You know, um, you know, they were like your your they were your fairy tale. Bournemouth yeah. was the fairy right. tale. Fans like, were fans of other clubs boop, boop. were collecting money in buckets for them. To yeah, them but but like I, I I love the story. It was a fairy tale because it yeah. was like, okay, Bournemouth can do it. And you know, the first time they did it, okay, you could say there was a Russian had money, but no, they got to the champ. Then a rush in his money, you know, and, and it wasn't just all about money getting to the champ. Mm-hmm. I remember what Eddie Howe did and his staff, and then they get up and then they're there for a while and then they come back down. Uh, uh, if that's true, and I, I, I'm not believing anything written in the press yeah. until I hear it verbatim, I'd be very disappointed if that was true that Bournemouth were one of those who didn't want to do a deal. Nottingham Forest, I'm not surprised about it because of who they're owned by and yeah. whatever else. So I get that, you know what I mean? But the irony there is if they end up going down, you know, they'll have shot themselves on the mm-hmm. fucking foot. Um, you know, and, and, you know, particularly if they go down and stay down for a prolonged period, you know, where that can happen in the football league. Um, I guess my people ask me to go on media and speak about it. I want to, I want to speak to the EFL more. I saw the statement from the EFL. I thought it was a bit of a meh, meh statement that came out. I wanted us to be more aggressive. I wanted mm-hmm. us to be angrier. Um, I, I, I'd love to get in a room with the 20 Premier League clubs. I'd love to talk about what's your thought process. Yeah. The one thing that came out of it where they said about, well, all you're going to do is give the money to the players and, and agents. I agree with them there. Mm-hmm. I agree with the Premier League. Not that they should get to tell us how to spend money. But I agree that if, if you're doing this deal to help EFL clubs and all we're going to do is increase our wage bills and pay more agents and pay more players, I 100% agree that can't happen. I've said it all along. This money should be used for a couple of things. One, most importantly, infrastructure facilities. Yep. That's really important. Every club needs it. We've seen it with pitches this year. We've seen it with training grounds. Let's not mention training grounds, Reading, Wickham. We've, we've seen these things happen. The other thing is to reduce debt. You know, the reason clubs are in so much trouble is because they've got debt. Yeah. So so that money should be used to, to bring overheads down and debts down, but also to spend a large proportion on facilities. So I wouldn't be against agreeing for a period right. of time in any deal that this money has to be ring fenced for yep. these specific not that we should be told that to spend it but i agree with the sentiment of what they've said i'd like to get in a room with them and go yeah i agree with that here's a compromise i'd also like to say why we're doing a compromise and you're writing us a check for the money that we should get and you know we're a big part of the pyramid let's talk about the loan system mm-hmm. let's talk about fixing that let's talk about ben white playing for peterborough for a year then playing for leeds in the efl and then getting sold for 50 million you know, let's talk about Ivan Tony. Let's talk about Jadal Katonga, Man City, who've been fantastic with us, by the way. It's probably going to be worth 100 million in two, three years' time. Let's talk about the made in the EFL. Let's talk about the loan system. Let's talk about how how badly the loan system is regards having to pay wages, accommodation, all those things when we're developing talent. The Bristol Rovers manager spoke about it himself, mm-hmm. about they developed three players yep. and should they get it. And he was absolutely right, Wade. He, what he said was absolutely correct. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, Bristol Rovers have helped develop multiple players like we have helped develop yeah. multiple players that are playing for England, playing in the Premier League. So that's what really grates you when you see this shit about, well, fuck, fuck them. We're going to say no and we're going to take legal action and we're not even going to make an offer and that kind of attitude. No, 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 no. If you want to be the MLS and you want to close shop mm-hmm. and you want to no relegation and you want to fuck the EFL off, let me tell you what's going to happen to your ratings in the next 10 years yeah. when you go to redo your next deals. 
like the MLS who've been scratching their arses, running around trying to get more money and Apple came in and saved the day, you're going to struggle. Your product's not going to be as good. Your product won't be as fucking romantic. It certainly won't have that genocide quad EFL and the pyramids yeah. have over the years. So if you want to go about destroying your product in the name of short-term greed instead of thinking a long-term gain, how about it? Because I think it'll be the biggest mistake you'll all make in your lives. Because we saw how fans turned against the Premier League and the Super League. Mm -hmm. You want to go down that route? Watch how your fans are going to turn against you then. So the power of the football fan is something not to be underestimated. And I think if the Premier League keep pushing, more and more clubs fans are going to go, no, that's not right. As much as they're like Chelsea forever and Liverpool yeah. forever, you know, Liverpool fans, I would expect a lot of their fans to be on our side because they're like they're, they're like people of the, the salt of the earth. Yeah. You know, they understand, you know what I mean, and, and whatever. So I'm disappointed, and I'm disappointed it's taken months to get to the point where, again, it's like, yeah, no offer. Yeah, down the line. Yeah, we might, we might sue. We'll leak. I, I'm just so disappointed that all these talks and all these conversations, we've led to that. So I'm ready to suit and boot. And go in a room. Mm -hmm. Send the send the Lord of the boardroom in. Send the closer in. I'm happy to go in. People will be like, oh, he's too this, he's too well. trust me. Yeah, there's nobody better when it comes to talking about our product, the EFL, and, and and fleshing out a deal. They want to use me, I'll do it for free. I'll pay my own air flight, I'll get an airplane, and I'll go and stand in front of the 20 CEOs of the, of the Premier League, owners, whatever, uh, and I'll flesh out a deal. Because it's the right, they all know it's the right thing to do. You know, Palace, Steve Parrish, friend of mine, but I disagree with him on this. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're another one as well. You know, I remember when they beat us and sent us down and then it flipped for them and they went up and then they could have got relegated multiple times. It, it, it's fundamentally wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Our product is interwined. It's together. You know, now they're taking away cup replays as well. There's so much right. stuff going on. It's just a shaft and the little guy. And yeah, people can go on, but Dara, you're a capitalist, not a socialist. You're absolutely right. I don't, I don't profess for socialism. But this is an entertainment industry that we're all part of. This is a bit like your writer strike in California, mm -hmm. your movie star strike. They weren't all striking for themselves at the top earning the big bucks. They were striking for the little guys. Yeah. They were striking for the cameramen getting paid $9 an hour who they felt should have got 14 from all the big studios. So the big guys with all the money went on a joint strike because they agreed something needed to be done because the camera guy was almost as important. 20 mm -hmm. of those camera guys is like the importance of one actor yeah. because of all the work they do behind the scenes. So... You know, we as a league, as a business, we're just, we're, we're important. I get the entertainment, the trillion dollar industry is your Liverpool's, your Man United, your Man Cities and everything else. But they have to understand that we play a big part in their success. We just do. We always will. And, and, and for the betterment of our game, for common sense, a deal needs to be done. And there's no point in threatening each other. And there's no point in falling out over it. We have to sit down and go, what are the key fundamental issues going on within our game? The distribution, the money, the mechanism. The lack of the lack of wealth spread outside of parachute of clubs who come down from the Premier League, and you start taking everyone else into account. You know, the poor facilities, the things that we're like desperate about. And they're absolutely right. We spend too much money on players' wages and agents. And there's that that needs that balance needs to be changed. We tried that a few years ago and the PFA shut us down. So we need to revisit that. Um the academy structure where we lose players because we signed that deal years ago. We were forced into signing where now Premier League clubs can steal mm -hmm. players. We have, and I shouldn't even say this. We have in our 14s and 15s four of the best players we've ever created to our academy. They will be in our first team in three years. Mm -hmm. And the good news for Posh fans is they're all attackers and they're all quicker than Ricky J. Jones. And they are they are players we are desperate to get into our first team. We can't wait. We can't sign a professional until they're 17. So there's always a fear yep. that they could get plucked and stolen. Yep. These particular lads, their parents are great and they're with us and they can see the pathway. But at any time, a big boy could steal one. And, you know, I'll give you another example. We saw Benji Arthur, you know, mm -hmm. for just under a million in the summer. He never played for us. He was on the bench against Arsenal at the weekend yeah. for Brentford. You know, he, he will play for England. He will play in Bre Brentford. will sell him for 100 million, probably in five years' time or three years' time. He's, he's a typical centre-half that they love and, you know, the big boys. So we play our part. And I just feel this attitude of a regulator is not going to tell us what to do. The government's not going to tell us what to do. Maybe you're right about the government, whatever. Yeah. They shouldn't tell you what to do. But you know what? You, you you keep doing this and you keep furrowing away and getting more money and more money and less money comes to the clubs outside the three that go down and, and the way it's done in League One and League Two and in the chat, it's, it's just fundamentally wrong. It's actually cruel. Someone asked me the other day in business, I was talking to someone in America, I was actually in Dubai about business and they were like, you know, you're one of the top 50 clubs in, in, in England. 
you know, and I'm like, yeah, you're right. If you look at Peterborough's position, mm -hmm. you know, the Premier League, the Championship, we're probably top 50 out of 92 clubs. Yeah. Right? And you, got, you know, your TV deal must be, you know, what do you get, like 10 million a year or whatever? And I was like, no. And they were like, oh, what do you get, five? And I'm like, no. And they're like, what do you get? I said, lower. They were like, three? And I'm like, no. And they are like, fuck off. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, go lower. And they were like, okay, two. And I was like, no. It's less. And they couldn't fucking believe mm -hmm. that, like, you know, out of our income, 15% of it, whatever, that comes from the TV and the Premier League solidarity. And we're one of the top 50 clubs in England. How can that be possible? How does that work? And even you look a bit stunned there, yeah. I've just said that. How yeah. could that be possible? So if we want to make football better, if we want to make all the clubs better, which is better for the product, better for the overall next TV deals, and while I still go on about EFL need to get their product better, and that's another conversation I'm going to have in the summer with them, you know, we have to get a deal done. And I know the EFL are trying. I know the people in power are trying. I know Rick is, is leading this charge, you know, but we're here to help. And I'm hoping some common sense can, you know, to just come out and just go like that. Instead of coming out and going, you know what we're going to do? We couldn't get an agreement today. We've got some clubs mm -hmm. who are dissenting. We've got some clubs who don't want to do it. We're going to sit back down in two weeks' time, and we're going to bring the EFL in. And we're going to have a conversation. But but just to be like, eh. Yeah, you that's what it felt like. Yeah. That's what it felt like. You're just like, eh, you're done. And it's like, eh, what? what, what? That, that, that's what it felt like. And, and, yeah, I'm just like, I'm pissed, you know, and I'm majorly pissed. And, you know, it's probably right the EFL put out a pretty kind of bland statement about it because mine would have been like, Stardust like pointing fingers, <laughs> like you know. Sorry, what Bournemouth? What for the London Forest? What? what sorry, what? what? Sorry, were you guys not with EFL a couple of years ago? What? What? You know, and I, and I love clubs like those clubs, and you know, I, I know the people at Bournemouth and stuff like that, and, and they've been good to us, and we've done business, and you know, in the past, and, and I'm just I'm disappointed because I know fundamentally their fans will be with us on this and go, no, 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 that can't be right. That can't be right. You talked about the MLS. It feels like the, the the trying to create. While you can't have no relegation, like the only jeopardy is where well, you're going to have a year in the championship. And three, up, three, up, three down, three down. Correct. And, correct. And that's the jeopardy. Correct. So it's almost a it's a close shot for 23 clubs. You know, yeah, correct. Because the three that's going to come up and then go straight back down again. Yeah, yeah exactly. And you got like this year, it'd be what Leicester, Leeds, and probably Southampton. Right. You know, unless you know Ipswich and unfortunately, you know, lost that game last week. It was terrible. Late on, but. It's probably going to be those three who go up again. So yeah, it's it's just like you know, okay, we have to. There's no point in like burying your head in the sand. A deal has to be done, whether you like it or not. A deal has to be done. What you don't want is a strike. What you don't want is is a fracture. What you don't want is is eyes on in a negative way that it's all about the greedy people higher up and basically like screwing everyone lower down. So you don't want it to get to that point where it's an all-out war. So okay, you're winning your mini battles at the moment, but you're not going to win the war. You know, because this has to happen. And you've been getting away with it for so long where you, a large slice of the pie has gone there. And even you could say the champ have been getting away with it for so long where they get 80-odd percent yeah. of all the revenue and we get our 12 and League 2 gets 8%. That's all gone on too long. Like, this this has to change. And and now with so many big clubs that have come from the champ down to League 1, even recently, your Portsmouth, mm -hmm. your Sunderland or whatever, you'd like to think if there was another vote, well, maybe that would change, you know, about that. So So, I don't know. It needs to be, the whole thing needs to be ripped up and redone, in my opinion. Yeah, and, I, and anyone listening, a journalist, don't write salacious headlines trying to paint me as like an anarchist or a bad guy or whatever. My heart's not in my wallet or for my club. My heart's in, as it's always been for 18 years, I believe in the bigger picture that I'm part of this football structure. And it, it breaks my heart when I see a Torquay going to admin and mm -hmm. I see a you know, clubs like that, Rochdale, new, I think now finally getting sold. When I see clubs go through the mill, I fucking hate it. I don't I don't find any joy. I saw the Reading thing this week, yeah. and I'm like, fuck you, I'm gutted. Even though they're a massive club, I'm like, God almighty, Jesus, their fans don't need this. Do you know what I mean? So that that's who I am. I love football. I'm a football fan. I don't want any of our clubs, like, you know, getting in trouble or, you know, whatever else. So something has to happen, Philip, and um, I'm willing so, to drive it. So, So what's next? What's next is is I'm I'm waiting. I've asked my CEO to find out, you know, a bit more detail from the EFL. What's next, mm -hmm. and then you know I you know probably when I'm in the UK, this isn't going to happen until the summer now. With a lot of things, in my opinion, they're like kicking the can down the road. A lot of clubs were hoping for a little bit of a windfall this season, right. and they're not getting it. 
So what's next is I want to talk to other owners. I, I, I don't want to speak to CEOs in the EFL. I want to speak to owners. I've said this. I want like owners meetings now where we even get them on Zoom calls, wherever they are in the fucking world. I want to talk to owners and go, you know, guys, what are we doing here? Like, what are we doing? Are we together? Or are we not together? Mm -hmm. Because it's time now. I think the only way we win is being together. We're going to continue playing our own little games on the side and, you know, because, oh, we're going to get back to the Premier League. We're, no, fuck this. We're together. We're the AFL. If we're together, we're stronger. If it's fractured, we're weaker. And as seen in the Premier League with the little breakaway plan for the Super League, that blew up in their fucking face and frightened the life out of them. So let's frighten the life out of them yeah. again. So you mentioned um, Reading and what's going on with Reading's training ground oh. this week. And Wickham, uh, it talks, it's not been finalised, but they both signalled mm. pretty strongly that it's going to happen. Um, hey, what, I, didn't know Wick, I didn't know Wickham had a fucking billion. I know. Owner. No, me what neither. What the fuck? That blew saw, my mind. I saw this and thought, where the hell are they getting 22 million from? Yeah. Yeah, I was like, I, I, I didn't know the Coolings, you know, nice guys who were running Wickham. I didn't know that. I, I must have missed it. You know, I mean, my head's been on my ass with so much stuff. But Jesus Christ almighty, 22 million they've pulled out. Well, this fella has or whatever. Yeah. You know, look, they have had death threats, I think, the people at Wickham over this and whatever. And I, I think this is where it goes too far sometimes. Yeah. So on one hand, you've got Reading who are a death store financially. You've got an owner who's just driving their fan base mad. I don't disagree. And I've talked about the EFL, us putting things in place so that this can't happen in future. And, and nothing's gone on there. And that owner said, well, if I sell the training ground, it'll keep the club alive. But the problem you've got then is if you do that, it makes it less attractive to buy. Yeah. The other concern is I think he owns the training ground separately from the club. So they're worried, okay, if he gets 22 million, is he keeping the 22 million? Because he always professes to put 200 million in or 150 million in or whatever else. And paying off his he director's then, loans or whatever. In, with yeah, which, yeah, which legally he's allowed to do. Yeah. And as much as people won't like that, that's just legally a fact. And then you've got the flip to it is, is that Wickham have gone in and done a deal and bought an unbelievable asset, if that's what they've done, which is an unbelievable asset, by the way. And I believe it's a Berkshire as well. No, the mm -hmm. training ground is like some of the most expensive real estate. I'm, I'm not sure of the geography about where Reading is from Wickham. I think someone said it was 25 miles or whatever. Yeah, um, it's not next door, but it's not too far away. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't think you need to be angry at Wickham. I don't think you should be, and I'm, you know me, my history I know. with Wickham. But I, 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 I don't think you need to be sending death threats, particularly if, if, if the money is ended up, allows Reading to stay alive and then find a new owner. Fantastic. Maybe if I were the Reading owner to appease the fans, would be to put something in there that maybe any new Reading owner has got an option mm -hmm. to buy the ground to buy the training ground back for thirty million. Yeah, in like twelve in six months' time or yeah. four months' time or whatever, which kind of appeases them. By ways, all right, let me go find now. Uh, I've been bailed out. The, the the Wickham guys end up cashing in and make a few million for doing nothing. You know, good to know they've got that kind of money. I'm sure they could probably find somewhere near Wickham and build an unbelievable mm -hmm. training ground for that kind of dough. Um. You know, so which is great news for Wickham fans, by the way, and I'll expect to see them competing at the top end of League One next year. You know, that kind of doubt they've got to, to to spend as well. So, um, so I think there's a there, there's a way there of making a deal that just gets everyone happy. And I think the Reading owner needs to tell everyone what he's doing. Look, I'm I'm getting 22 million. I'm going to take 12 from me. I'm going to stick 10 in the club. Yeah. The club now is paid for for the next 12 months. Yeah. A rebuild in the summer, even if I don't sell, which will allow us to rebuild in League One. And by the way, the club's got no more debt, and now it's for sale. Mm -hmm. And then Bosch. Oh, and by the way, there's an option in there where they can buy the training ground back. Da 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 da. da. So th there has to be a, a happy compromise, and or even further still, as part of the deal, Reading get to share the training facility right. because it's so big for the next three years rent free. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, yeah. I'm I'm speculating, but as much as you want to be angry with Wickham, people are saying they're like pulling a, a an MK Dons and doing all of that. I, I'm not sure your anger anger should be pushed at Wickham. The fans, that might be controversial to some of the Reading fans. I'm with you, Reading fans, by the way. I, I want you to get a good owner. It's a terrific club. Um, but this isn't Wickham's fault. And by the way, what if no one buys it and he ends up putting you into liquidation? Yeah. And you could have been rescued by selling to Wickham. Would that be okay then? Yeah, I, I agree with you because I was seeing the, the hate against Wickham and thinking, you know, they had the opportunity to buy a state-of-the-art trading facility at cut-down price <laughs> and you're not going to just uh you, you know if you have the money to buy it it's a no-brainer you can't blame wickham for buying that um but you know can you blame reading for 
being in the position where that's what they had to do. And now there's a distressed asset on the market that they got to get rid of quickly, and therefore that's informing the price. Absolutely. I don't think it's Wickham. Wick, again, like you said, Wickham isn't where the um, the frustration and the ire should be going for um, on this one. And you see, if we if we done a football deal with the Premier League and the EFL got what they needed, and then we changed the rules, like I've always said, where the EFL could go in, suspend the owner of the club, take the club, use a central full funnel of money to pay the bills until it's mm-hmm. sold. And then, you know, which basically keeps Reading alive, yeah. means they don't need to sell the training ground, they don't need to sell whatever else. And then when it's sold, the money's paid back to the EFL plus interest and whatever's left is paid to the owner. You know, if, if, if we got a system in place like that, which you'd have to change the rules now to do, and I'd be okay with that, you know, that there justifies, this is why we need the Premier League to yeah. give us a bigger deal. This is why we need the EFL to have a pool of money for helping clubs to get in trouble so they don't go into administration they're not selling assets off bottom whatever else they put in a director of football that's efl appointed like a barry fry they put in football people who know what they're doing where you're not selling people for one p on the pound you know and basically until it's such place it can then be sold and then everyone's pay back the efl make a bit of interest and money which is then pooled and sent out to loan to people to do pitches there is a way of doing this and we yeah. only have to look at the NFL and look at other sports things and go, hey, they, they have it really well. They do it really well. NFL guy wants to build a new stadium. The NFL lend them a big proportion of the money, all the owners do. And then they get paid back and it's good mm-hmm. for the product, good for the fans. And, you know, this isn't rocket fucking science. This is a business, by the way. And, and for Reading, like, I understand the pain. We went through, you have to do what you can to get the cash to survive. And the only thing, now you're in... You're in short-term mode. And I think we, we had two administrations in three years or four years in the yeah. 2000s. You know, and one of them led to us ending to sell Valley Parade for yeah. peanuts, basically. We yeah. sold Valley Parade for, I don't know, 2.2 or 2.5 million or something like that. Um, because if we didn't, we, we were going to get wound up, you know, two weeks later. And so we had to take the deal. And here we are 25 years later and we're still paying the price. For having done but that. equally but would wouldn't, be no it be great? Club? wouldn't it be great if there was a system where yep. you could go to the efl and say we need two and a half million to stay in business or we're going to sell the club mm. the efl then have the power to turn around and say hey we will give you the money to survive but we now take over running the club yeah we're going to run the club we're going to sell the club you're going to get x the bills are going to get paid and it's done you have the choice to say no, but then you've got to end up selling your stadium, getting the shit, and you know, blah, 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 you know yeah. options, business options. You know, what I mean? even, you just don't have it. Even if there's a fund where the EFL could buy the stadium and then Correct. do a, you know, kind of a, a buyback, sell and buyback, it's because yeah. you know, at probably an average rent of three or four hundred grand for uh, twenty five years, which is what we've paid. We've paid many times more than the cost of the uh, right. Uh, Correct. Got, Correct. Right. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about. I think there are so many solutions potentially out there that we as businessmen who are not involved in a lot of these big decisions need to be. Because there's a reason we were able to buy football clubs because we're quite good at business. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? so, yeah. So I think some of that help needs to be given to the EFL. So let's uh, just touch on a couple of other things um, yeah. today. So um, first of all, the England squad and um, Ivan Tony being called up to the England yeah. squad. Good call. On the other side, Ben White basically saying that he doesn't want to be picked. What do you make of that situation? He had an issue at the last championship, didn't he, where he fell out with some coaches yeah. and didn't have a good experience. I know Ben, you know, from being with us, I know he's – I don't think he's a football fan. I think he's a family guy. Mm-hmm. I don't think he plays football because he loves football. I think he yeah. plays because he's very good at it and he's yeah. making millions. Yeah. So that's his call. I fully support any person who doesn't want to do something they don't want to do or have to do. So – and to be fair to Ben – is he going to get in above, you know, he's playing right back for Arsenal. You know, Kyle Walker, Trent Alexander-Arnold, you know, you've got certain players who are going to always probably play in front of him. So is he going to go away, not play, be away? You know, that mm-hmm. that's his choice. Mm-hmm. So any fan that criticizes Ben White over it will, you know, drag your, put your heads, wind your heads back in. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is funny what you say there because there are a lot of players who do play because they are good but not because they have the passion and as a supporter you just expect that everyone has the same passion as you do and that's why they (laughs) took the career path to become as good as what they are and that's not the case with all players i I, I would blow people's minds away if i told them about two or three of our players who've got no interest in football Mm -hmm. and i've spoken to our players and they didn't even know there was a game on the night before in the champions league or the premier league they have no interest in football 
They're just very good at football. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. I, I, I used to be fucking the king of selling houses. There was no better closer in selling real estate than me in my 20s and 30s. And I fucking hated it. Mm -hmm. But I was really good at it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, don't always follow your house. passion. That career advice yeah. of follow your passion and good things will happen might not always yeah, be. Yeah, 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 yeah. You just sometimes you're good at something. Yeah. It doesn't mean you fucking love doing it. You know what I mean? So, you, you know, that's just the way it goes. And then let's uh, let's go across um, to Ireland. And so, first of all, John O'Shea becoming interim manager. I know that you, uh, you know, you've spoken a lot about the previous regime. So, what's your feeling on John O'Shea coming in? I don't know. You know, I don't know enough about John. Um, I don't know enough about his background, coaching wise, and everything else. Uh, I think he's a caretaker, is he? I don't think yeah, he's interim. In, he's, I think. Yeah. So I know there's obviously, is there a funding issue in Ireland with getting managers? I don't know what's going on. I know that we've got a great group of talented players. I'm happy he's finally called Schmodix up. Schmodix yep. is going to win player of the year in the championship for me. I mean, there's nobody who deserves it more. And the fact he hasn't been capped by Ireland yet is fucking ridiculous when he's basically scoring 30 odd goals in the season. Um, how he hasn't called Jack Taylor up is beyond me. You know, again, that was a mistake. Um, but we have a great group of players and we have some bloody good players. So. The fact that Ireland are struggling to qualify for championships is a disgrace. We need to get, uh, hopefully O'Shea is the man. If not, we need to get a good competent manager in because this is, I think it's a golden generation coming up for Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll touch on one Premier League game uh, and it was obviously the big one on Sunday, Liverpool-Man City. Oh. So finished 1-0. Um, oh. I think that um, you know, when you went 1-0 down, like a, this doesn't look good. Um, uh, in we the brilliant. end, you were dis it was disappointing we for brilliant. people to only get a point. Yeah, I, I, I mean, Luis, Luis Diaz, I mean, I, I could have, like, strangled him. I mean, I know everyone was, like, going on about how good he was. I'm kind of the opposite and going, you know, we should have won the game if he'd been if he'd had his shooting boots on and you worry about him, he doesn't score enough goals and gets in too many good opportunities. And he hasn't really, you know, and I don't want people making headlines about me because I'm a fan of his. I love the type of player he is, but... I'm surprised he hasn't kicked on like others to become prolific because he's been mm -hmm. with us a couple of years now and maybe the injury set him back. But you look at a player like him and think he's playing a man in his position. You want 20 goals out of him. You want 10 assists out of him. And that was a game where he was in so many good... I thought we were superb. Again, the Jurgen Klopp effect. And I'm really excited about Liverpool. But at the same time, I'm worried. You know, we have this dearth of young talent coming through. We've got a great squad now. We've rebuilt really well. We've now got like Edwards back. We've got some key components coming back to to be CEO of the football group. We've got um um you know a new I think director of football starting in the summer mm -hmm. potentially from I think it's Bournemouth. I've read is a Richard Hughes. So structurally there, as long as we get the right manager, I think we'll be okay. I don't think we'll be competing for four or five trophies next year. I think it'll take a while because you're following Jurgen Klopp, and I almost want to say to Jurgen, take a year off and come back. You know, so it's the Jurgen Klopp effect. I thought he out, out coached Guardiola magnificently in that second half because I really feared in the first half we were going to go under. And that told me we're going to be there till the end, which surprised me because I still think Man City will win by 10 points. I've been saying that all season, yeah. but I'll probably be wrong. You know, so yeah, good run. Yeah. Good they time, got, I think. They haven't got much longer to get that 10 point lead. Um, 100%. How, how long do you give Luis Diaz before you decide he's not going to be the goal scorer? He's never going to be the goal scorer you want him to be. Um, you know, if you're asking me, you know, the other day, I, you know, I know he took Nunez off and, and kept Diaz on. I'm a Nunez fan. I love him. Um, I think, obviously, with injuries, he's managing his time. How long do you give Luis Diaz? I'd probably, uh, he's, you know, another year. You mm -hmm. know, and if cause he's 26 now, 27. So you'd like to think next year, I'd want 15 plus goals and, and 10 assists because that's what a winger's job is in that front. You look at Salah last night, he scores, but he makes three goals. You look at Darwin Nunez, he scores, but he makes goals. For me, Diaz doesn't make enough goals. Um, I think there's a player in there, but it's taken a bit longer than others. I think if Jota's fit, you would have maybe in that game, would you have, would you have had Jota down the middle, Nunez out left, you know, Salah to the right? Is that your best front three when fully fit? I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm excited by the young talent coming through. You know, Dan's Clark, all these players, you know, or, you know, Kumas. I mean, there's some great young players coming through. So, look, you know, I'm a Diaz fan, but I want to see more from him. I expect more from him. That's my disappointment that, you know, a game like that was his chance to go, boom. Yeah. Sadio Mane plays in that game and scores two goals. Mm -hmm. So, so you know. So we've got a lot of questions that we've been sitting on over the last few weeks. Right. So I'm just going to bring a few quickly. I'm gonna, yep. uh, get a couple in here. So um, yep. John on email just asked if you've got any insight or dealings with the US-based company World Soccer Holdings, who seem to be buying Rochdale. Have you come across those guys before? Heard anything about them? Nope. 
No, nope, never heard um, of them. Um, Adam asks, do managers go through a medical before they sign a contract in the same way as players? No, maybe it's a good idea. I think if they're like a bit older and heavier, potentially. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my manager was an ex he was a player when we signed him yeah. and he still runs six miles a day. So, you know, he's fit as a fiddle. But I presume that the LMA have their own medical process of testing him every year. I think they do that and they have to do that, you know, to make sure because... You know, they're prime for heart attacks, some of these managers. So, yeah, yeah. you only have to watch Stevie Evans the other night, right. basically. Fucking, he was imploding in that director's box, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so you're always like, Jesus, you know? So I think people's health, yeah, they need to look at it. What else? Next question. Uh, something from Dale. So Dale is a Doncaster um, fan who actually watched one of the games when Doncaster played at Valley Parade. His question is, at what point is a pitch deemed unplayable? So we've seen a lot of pitches that, you know, there's no grass on them, but they're rolled flat. Go what back to the 80s. Have yeah, a look no. at Liverpool winning all those titles in the 80s. They're on rugby fields. You know what I mean? So I guess the referee deems it unplayable where he throws a ball down and it stops. Um, he looks at dangerous areas. You always look around just the edges of the pitch, areas where players can hurt themselves. And, um, you know, if they're, if, if a pitch had like fucking, you know, badger holes in the middle of the pitch where you could break an ankle and things yeah. like that. So I guess that's down to the referee and the interpretation. There's no doubt there's a, it's really been eyes on this year that a lot of clubs including us have struggled with pitches mm -hmm. and you know i'm dealing with that at the moment quotes and we just we spend so much money and we're just trying to get it right all the time and all these companies are going to tell you they're going to get it right and then fucking a year later you're you're looking at firing them and moving you know it's it's just a constant i i feel we've got now the right guys who i'm working out now with what we're trying to do with pitches but if we're not in the chat, we can't go down the Deso route. If we, if it's Plan B or C, it's it's less. But will the pitch stand up then? And there's all those and things you, to go into. And you got to make so decisions expensive. now. Uh, you can't make that decision it, if it, and when you got promoted. It's really difficult. Yes, you're absolutely correct. I am. I'm, I've got options in front of me now. I have to make decisions pretty soon, mm -hmm. and I'm probably not going to be Deso pitches because yeah. I just I can't make that call. Right. Because we just as a League One club, but you know, and unfortunately, the Deso company they're not doing finance. So they want me to find 600 grand. And I just, mm. I've got other, uh, you know, as a club, we're just not in a position where we where we have that to plunk down when we got yeah. a shop we're doing and we're doing this and doing that. And yes, the pitches are important. So it won't be that we'll have shit pitches. We'll still spend six figures and a lot of money, mm -hmm. but it won't be, you know, a, a deso straight off the bat, potentially. So we're working through that at the moment. We just don't know. It would be great if there was a fund we could borrow from that could help us, like I keep saying, the EFL. Yeah. So we're good for the money, but unfortunately it doesn't exist. Next question. And a couple that are really tied in together. Um, so I think Dwight York said that he's been having to buy a club to be given the chance of being a manager. And then we have Neil who talked about uh, asking your thoughts on Dennis Bergkamp, Henrik Glass, and, and Dirk Kite being rumored on buying a League One or Two club so that, uh, well, not so that, but that, that Henry Glass and as part of that would come in as a manager. So people buying clubs to become managers or to become... Yeah, I don't, I, I, well, A, I don't think any of those you mentioned probably could afford to buy a League One club. They'd have to have money behind them because everyone seems to think, oh, buy a League One club. League One clubs now are north of 15 plus million, depending on, you know, mine would be a lot more. So because you've got assets, other yeah. clubs, not so much. You Even for a club with loads of debt and no great assets in their playing team, you're going to be paying probably 14 million plus for it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, they would have to get... As for them to be managers, well, you know, I, Dwight's obviously referring back to the colour of his skin right. while he said that. Um, I've never seen a, a, a CV come in from Dwight York for the Peterborough's job. Mm -hmm. So you, you can go on about that all you want, but uh, if you don't ask the question or reply, um, you know, nobody representing Dwight York's ever put a CV application in the last three times we've changed manager. And it was quite public that we fired a manager, but I, I never saw a CV. So if you've given up on asking, I... I I think we're changing that now perception. I think more and more people, there's not enough black coaches in the game. I agree. Mm -hmm. And we've had some really good ones who've gone on to work for England. And we lost Jamal recently who went to America. You know, if you're good enough, you get an interview and get the job. I don't give a shit what you look like. Yeah. At the end of the day, I give a shit if you're good at what you do. Yeah. Um, so I just want more options. So is it right there's not enough black coaches in the game? Probably. Okay, how do you change that? Mm -hmm. More black coaches as players need to take their badges. Yeah. I tell every player when they hit 29, start yeah. taking your badges. Don't matter what a player looks like, go take your fucking badges. I told Aaron McLean to do it. Didn't fancy the coach with us. Didn't work out. What did I tell Aaron to do? Media. Mm -hmm. You make a lot of money in media. I told him, go and do this. I met him for lunch. I said, get into BT, get into Sky, get into non-league. I said, non-league would be a niche for you because there's no one in there really like yeah. you as regards to come from non-league, played in the league, get in, start there. Then you start getting picked for all the bigger ones. And he's had a great fucking career. I would tell all you know players the same. So 
certain players want to do it, don't want to do it. But I think to to say I need to buy a club to be a manager is just the lazy, fucking stereotypical, stupid yeah. comment. And the, you know, to, to, what do you hope to achieve by saying that? What happens when it, What happens when it goes wrong? Well, you know, the Dwight. I haven't seen Dwight coaching for any League One or League Two yeah. clubs. I'm sure if it, you know, do you, some coaches come in and, and and they offer their services and they they earn very little and they want to take your 21s team, you know, go and apply, make your way up the ladder. They made enough money, a lot of these Premier League players in their Premier League career, to be able to. They ain't got the hunger for nothing. I'm sorry, but, black or white. Some of those mentioned don't have the hunger. Yeah. They don't have the burning desire. They don't have the desire to go and work in a 21s team in the bottom of League Two, mm -hmm. take them to the top of the 21s uh, league, become the next man up if the manager loses his job, get in the first team opportunity, win games, become a manager. I don't think they've got the hunger, some of them. Yeah. The ones who've made the big bucks at the Playboy lifestyle, I'm not sure they have the hunger or the desire. They want to come in in the champ, they want to pull a Lampard, they want to pull a, you know, whatever else. But They want to stay sorry. in the game, but they don't want to put the hard yards yeah. in. Or they want the Wayne Rooney wages when you go yeah. to this club and that club. Well, that's yeah. not football management for me. Yeah. You want an opportunity, there's a whole system of academies, uh, reserve teams, coaching. Come in and earn your 30 grand a year, mm -hmm. like these guys out there seven days a week grafting. Then you can cry if you don't get an opportunity. All right, well, that, let's call that a day. Um, thank you again, as always, and um, <laughs> we'll be back. Uh, we'll try and get something in next week. I think we're both uh, here in for it, maybe after the couple of games in midweek, uh, the Saturday game and the midweek game. But sure. uh, keep those questions coming. Uh, contact at hardtruthfootball.com or on any of the social media channels. So thanks, then. guys. Appreciate we'll you soon. Cheers. Bye.